Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Mexico, Austria. Wow. Okay. So. So welcome. This is Ciatar Europa's anti-racism learning series. This is the eighth in the learning series. My name is B. Bauman. I am a member of CETAR Europa's communication committee and a member of CETAR Germany. And I have Christine Taylor with me and she is the storyteller. Uh, and tonight the series is, um, Storytelling and anti-racism. There are two sides to every story experience. As more people come into the room, I will start talking about the um, committee guidelines that we follow. And that is uh, to assume positive intent to manage our emotions and to provide a safe, inclusive and positive environment for the attendees, for the speaker and for the moderator. The chat will be moderated and facilitated by a member of the CETAR Europa board. And if you look down at the bottom of your screen, I believe you see the Q and A. So once we start, once Christine lets us know she wants to start the Q&A, you can put your questions in there or begin to put questions in there as they come up. I can say a little bit about Christine that I know. I know she has told me that she is the immigrant daughter of an immigrant mother and that she taught intercultural awareness in Amsterdam. And uh, that she has her own company that she started in 2017. So I think she's gonna tell us more about those, those things when she begins her talk. Let's see, so. Uh, we're, we're at five minutes after six. Thank you all for coming and I'll turn over to Christine Taylor. Hi everyone, B, thank you so much for the introduction there. I am going to go ahead and share my screen with y'all because of course we have pretty pictures as much as we can manage. And B, can you see that? Yep. Great. Thank you. All righty. So we're going to talk about storytelling and anti-racism today. And I am so thrilled that so many of you are interested in this because when Tamara asked me if I would do this talk, I first thought I got nothing to say. Turns out I've got quite a bit to say. So I'm excited to run it by you. And I hope that I will encourage you to think more deeply on how you can use storytelling and also to ask more questions. If you have questions, please go ahead and pop them in the Q&A whenever they come up for you. We will manage looking at them and answering them as best we can afterwards, but I would hate for you to have a question that doesn't get answered. So let me introduce myself. My name is Christine. Uh, I am Taiwanese and American. I have an American passport and these days also a Dutch passport. Stories usually in the form of a, of a book, a novel have been a constant in my life from childhood through adulthood. They're my teachers, my companions, they're my solace. And in my, my great failure in life is not yet having found a way to get paid to read books. I also love people stories though. And I learned this skill from my father. And the skill is to listen and to meet people where they are. And there's a moment from when I was a child living in Rapid City, South Dakota of all places we were at the Central States Fair and I looked over because I couldn't find my dad and he was standing, not standing, squatting next to someone in a wheelchair speaking to them, a complete stranger to him and us before that moment. And it, that moment has stayed in my mind for the rest of my life as an example of physically 
and also emotionally meeting people where they are. And I try to do that in my storytelling and in my listening. And the good news is I get to ask people lots of very personal questions and they often give me great detailed answers. So, so this is a quote from uh, Ben Okri. It says, stories are wiser than we are. They are enigmas. We never get to the bottom of them any more than we get to the bottom of ourselves. I really believe a story is something we can go back to over and over again and learn lessons after lessons from them. Now, when George Floyd was murdered and the Black Lives protests were happening in the United States, which felt very far away from where I am in Nijmegen, we could go to a protest here, socially distanced, wearing masks. But what I could do was put something on social media. And for me, that was a series of all of the Black authors I could find in my home. Um, to my great delight, there were many more than I thought there would be. And to my disappointment, we were lacking in areas like children's books that needed to be filled in. So really, I believe that stories are a vital piece in the puzzle that we need to fill in in order to really do the work of anti-racism. So let's start with definitions. What is a story? We're all interested in stories because they are the best way to communicate. Once a story has sustained our attention long enough, we may begin to emotionally resonate with the story's characters. Imagine that story is now a person telling you a story about themselves. We can also emotionally resonate with the person telling that story. Stories draw the listener in. They give us a view on the world that's different to our own. And they give us a very, very specific perspective on the world and the events in it. They help us to connect with each other. I always contend that if you tell a story to an audience, you're never talking to a mass of people. You're connecting with every individual person in that audience because your story speaks to each person in its own way. The other thing that I love about stories is that we like stories because we are addicted to stories. Our bodies are actually addicted to stories. The neuroscience of storytelling is fantastic. We have uh, our bodies release dopamine and oxytocin. Dopamine is a neuroreceptor, neurotransmitter, sorry, that has to do with emotion and memory. And it helps us to learn from stories because remember what happens in a story better than remember loose facts. Oxytocin is a hormone our bodies produce when we're listening to stories. It's the same hormone that nursing mothers produce when they're nursing their babies. It facilitates connection and closeness. So we're bi biologically wired to be receptive to stories to connect to storytellers and to remember what people tell us in a story. The next thing that's amazing to me is that our brain waves sync up with storytellers. So right now, I get to do the magic trip of making your brain sync up with my brain as I speak to you and give the presentation. The thing that's super magic is say tonight after this is over or tomorrow at breakfast, you tell someone else about what we're talking about and you tell them what this presentation is about their brains will sync up with where my brain is right now. And that's how we create kind of a unity in huge groups of people through storytelling. So stories really are the basis of culture. They continue to fill an ancient function of binding society by reinforcing a set of common values and strengthening the ties of common culture. Story is the basis for culture. It's why we use stories. We use human examples when we're talking about culture so we can understand it better. So, I want to talk a little about what makes a story a story because right now I find that story is a word we use really freely. When we give a pitch, sometimes we call it a story. If we're talking about a vignette or a scene, sometimes we call it a story. When I talk about a story, I have three particular criteria in mind. One is that a story has a structure. The basic story structure is a beginning and a middle and end. Now, there are lots of discussions we can have about culturally, cultural norms that are put on story structure. We can have discussions about gender norms put on story structure, but I do believe that a story always brings the listeners in, brings your audience in, has a middle where things happen and has an end so the audience knows that the story is over. Um, the other things that we always have are a hero. The hero isn't necessarily the main fixture in the story. It is always the perspective from which the story is told meaning that's the, the eyes through which we usually see the story. Now, if you, we wanna get complicated and write wonderful novels, then that perspective may be from somewhere else, but it will always center on a character. And the perspective is important because the hero and the perspective, that's the person who learns something in the story. 
So that means that that person undergoes some kind of change, either an internal change because they learn something or an external change. Maybe they go from being the girl who washes, who cleans the dust on the Cinderella character to being the princess. So there's some kind of change that a hero undergoes in a story in order to make it a story. And the last thing is that a story is always where the hero is dealing with a problem or a dilemma or a conflict. And Shada came up with these, introduced these terms to me in a workshop uh, last week, and they're perfect to articulate the three different things that happen in stories. So I'm gonna borrow them here. Stories have a life and existence of their own that is beyond just us telling them or where it lives in a book. They, um, if you look at the story of Cinderella, it starts as a Chinese fairy tale. It gets picked up by Grimm's in what's now Germany. Perrault does a version in French, and then it moves on to Hollywood and we have versions of it like Pretty Women. A story doesn't belong to us. We just borrow it to tell it for a while. And I believe that's true of stories like fairy tale, stories that are out there and the personal stories we tell. The question is, which stories are we going to borrow and which stories need to stay with the speaker who originally told them? There's lots to talk about there as well that we're not gonna get into today. So I've prepared this presentation focusing mainly on the stories we tell and listen to as opposed to the stories that we read and write. So I will be talking about things in terms of listening and telling stories. So storytelling and anti-racism. This is why we're here. First definition for me, anti-racism. When we choose to be an anti-racist, we become actively conscious about race and racism and take actions to end racial inequalities in our daily lives. Being anti-racist is believing that racism is, that racism is everyone's problem and we all have a role to play in stopping it. The words that are important to me are taking action and that we all have a role to play. I believe that anything that is remotely close to anti-racism means that you're doing something. You can't take an anti-racist position. You have to do something, whether it's saying, I disagree with you. Are you sure that's what you want to say? That sounds racist to me. It's active. Um, so where does storytelling fit into anti-racism work? Well, first of all, another quote for you, everything I've learned about story reinforces the belief that only a commitment to truth and decency unbridles the full power of storytelling. That's from Jack Hart in his book, Story Craft, which I love the title. And he is talking about storytelling and journalism. And I think that it's so true for any kind of anti-racism work that we want to do. We have to look for truth, keeping in mind that my truth may be different than your truth. Our truth may be different than someone else's truth, but we have to be true to what our truth is and also decency, respecting other people, respecting ourselves, respecting circumstances, not going into finger pointing and accusation, talking about things from our perspective. These are all keys to making storytelling work in anti-racism. And there, from this, from the American Museum of African American History and Culture, I found links, we went to this great site and here were the steps we found for anti-racism work and I really want to go through them and how they relate to storytelling. The reading, which is self-educating, which stories are you choosing to read? What are you choosing to learn from? Asking yourself those questions and seeking out something new. Reflecting on what do stories mean to you? What's your story? Which story are you telling yourself about who you are or about the world around you? Remembering are we sharing the stories that, that matter? Are we sharing those important stories so they go into our collective memory? And what are we perpetuating with the stories that we are telling? Are we sure that we're telling good stories? And then there's taking a risk. When you decide to tell a story that's maybe outside of what you're used to telling, you take the risk that you could share, be called out as telling the wrong story. We have to share new stories, we have to share new voices, and we have to call out those stories that are racist and say, hey, that seems problematic to me, or have we considered this? Have you considered that? We have to expect rejection. If you're going to start telling new stories, some of them are going to land terribly, and that's going to happen. You may be called into question whether you have the right to tell a certain story or not. So those things are going to be happen. You have to engage in the conversations around those and building relationships, which comes down to telling your story, sharing what your experiences are, and listening well to others. The bulk of what I'm gonna talk about is about the two parts of storytelling. One is the storyteller, 
And the other one is the story listener. There are two people who participate in every storytelling interaction. One is giving, one is receiving, is how we're used to thinking of it. A storyteller gives a story and a listener receives it. What I'm going to talk about today is how a storyteller is always giving and receiving and how a listener is also always receiving and giving. So let me go into some of this for you. Yes, we're going to go on. We'll start with storytelling. So storytelling, stories are such an excellent tool in intercultural and anti-racism work. We tell lots and lots of stories. And this is how stories have been used ever since we were sitting on the campfire. Story is where human, where people go to practice key skills of human social life. Um, frankly, it's easier to hear a story about something and learn a lesson than to go through the pain yourself. So we as humans have developed this and we try to do it all the time. But here's the thing, as a storyteller, you're doing so much more than telling a story. If you listen to audiobooks, you know that there's a huge difference between listening to a skilled reader or one that you enjoy and someone who is just reciting the words off the page. You could never have a computer audiobook that could tell a story in the same way as a skilled audio actor. So when we're doing storytelling, we are doing so much more than just relaying the content of a story. First of all, we get to choose a story. And with every story we choose, we're saying no to thousands of stories that we're not including in what we're telling. We also get to interpret stories. Every version of a story is a performance. Every telling of a story is a performance. I am particularly interested in the versions of Little Red Riding Hood. There is the, what we think of as the traditional version, even though Little Red Riding Hood comes up across many, many cultures. I'm sure there are variations across all those cultures that I haven't learned yet. But there are also tellings like Angela Carter's telling. She has a Little Red Riding Hood story where Little Red Riding Hood and all of the other girls in the village have been trained to use knives. And when she runs into the wolf, things end very differently than her ending up in a belly. And the other is, I tell a version of Little Red Riding Hood, which has the world's first cross-dressing wolf. So every version of storytelling, every version of a story is the person is in the story. You can't remove yourself from the story when you're telling it. I think we often forget this because we think we're telling a story instead of being the story or representing the story. But keep that in mind, whatever story you're telling, you are taking on the story. Um, so the other thing is because you're choosing a story, you're telling a story, you're in an incredibly powerful position when you are storytelling. You have an audience that's captive and you get to tell them what's what in the world that you've created. So whoever makes up the story makes up the world. This is a quote from Ali Smith, who is a brilliant writer. And keeping this in mind, if we are telling only certain stories, what world are we creating? What world are we sharing? I know that I created a course in 2020. And when I finished and I was thinking back on how it went, I realized that almost all of the examples I used of leaders were white men in business to my great shame and embarrassment. And so one of the missions for me as I move forward is to use more black, Indian, uh, black indigenous and people of color authors and women in my examples as I am using citations or quoting people or using examples as in my work. Those are the kinds of things you can do. You can try to use authors or creators who are BIPOC, you can use, make sure the characters, the BIPOC characters in the stories you're using have agency, that they're not representing an idea, that they are including different voices, that your stories include different perspectives. And we can resist exoticism, which reinforces stereotypes. This happened really horribly to me yesterday evening in a way that I want to share with you because my husband is a fan of Law and Order. So we're watching the new series right now on on some kind of streaming, I think it's Amazon Prime. And yesterday, the episode that we watched had a black African woman telling the story of rape in, I believe it was Rwanda. And I say, I believe it was because the story was such a trope. It was such an idea we have of what life is in Africa that unfortunately I was ruining his TV viewing experience by yelling at the TV. Um, there are, it's not that these aren't important stories to be told, but we need a diversity of stories about 
all kinds of people. We need a diversity of experiences about all kinds of places that we are sharing. And if you're in a position to be the one who chooses the stories you're telling, you can be in the one who is adding diversity to the stories that people are hearing. And here are the benefits for storytellers when it comes to telling stories. And I wanna talk specifically about telling your own stories because there's two kinds of storytelling. There's the storytelling where you pick the story and then tell it the way I would tell a Red Riding Hood or a Cinderella story or, or any of a thousand other options. But then there's also the story you tell that's your personal story. And telling that kind of story comes with large risks. It can be very frightening as well, but it also can come with really, really wonderful benefits. So I wanna share some of those for you to think about. One is healing and unburdening. And this is a quote from uh, Beloved, which I recently read again. And she says, her story was bearable because it was his as well to tell, to refine and tell again. When we tell stories and we repeat them, we work through the stories literally um, in our hearts and in our minds to understand them better and to give them a place in our history. So telling a story is processing a story, even if you told it a hundred times. You can find new insights into your story every time you tell it. And part of that is also seeing how your audience responds as much as how you respond. It is also an unburdening. And I had a, a wonderful experience two summers ago, I think it was, where I told a story to someone and felt it was too personal and too painful. And I'm sorry, I didn't want to burden you. And he made it so clear to me, this was a friend at a summer camp and with adults, made it so clear to me that while I had experienced the storytelling as unburdening, he had not. And it made me understand that the kind of unburdening we get when we tell our stories, this is usually in a smaller circle, can unburden us, but puts no weight on the listener. It simply shares. So those are things that I try to think about a lot when I think about stories and which stories to tell. The other thing is that storytelling can be empowering and liberating. This is a quote from, um, Erin Horst with The Octopus and I, telling her story, shaping her story, and finishing her story, even if it wasn't quite the full story, had done something for her. Finding your voice, claiming the time for people to listen to you, puts you on the map. Your story matters. You matter. And having that attention can be empowering and liberating from the idea that my story should be hidden or isn't worth telling or has nothing to share. Your story is important because it is your story and that's all it needs. So it's an opportunity to tell your side of the story when you get to that stage, when you get the chance and it's an important one to take. Finally, you can learn so much from telling your story, not just because of the nuance you're gonna get from telling your story again and thinking through it again, but because every story is told to an audience and every audience gives something back to the storyteller. In a larger audience setting, it can be as simple as seeing in their faces or body language when people are engaged or not. So you can learn what part of your story captures your audience or not. In a smaller audience, you can respond to questions or emotions or seeing what people are getting out of your story. You get something back every time you tell your story and it will tell you more about your story and yourself in ways that can be absolutely amazing. So say you don't wanna tell your story, you want to choose a story to tell, then there are some things to think about as well in the event that you want to be using your story in the cause or in, in the work of anti-racism. So there's some questions you can ask yourself like, um, why are you telling stories? This is Nari Murad, she's a, she was a Yazidi refugee who now lives in the United States. And she said, I would have to be careful about what I said because words mean different things to different people and your story can easily become a weapon to be turned on you. These were her reflections on trying to figure out how to tell her story and who to tell it to when she escaped captivity. The questions are, what are you trying to accomplish with the story you're telling? Telling a story just to give information is very nice, but a story always does more than that. A story always proposes something. So you want to ask yourself, what is the goal? Why do you need a story here? And what will that story do in the, in the scope of the work you're doing? If you're giving a presentation and there's going to be a story, what is that story's job? If you are only going to tell a story, what is that story going to accomplish for your audience in the time that you tell a story? And will 
the message land or will something in the story distract them? You have to think about whether your story is shaped so that the message you want people to get is the one they're getting out of it. And this can happen if you have gaps in your story that you're not aware of and that your audience picks up on and that they got caught up in those gaps instead of being able to focus on those story. So that's where we get into story structuring and making sure that you have the details that you need, that your story is story enough, meaning that you're in the story and not telling an overview. We tend to tell things in an overview as opposed to getting into the story. And when we tell an overview, we leave huge gaps. But when we get on the ground and tell the story from a perspective, that hero's perspective, then we start to fill things in, which means our story can do its job better. The second question is going to be, who is your audience? If we can find someone who has earned the right to hear our story, then we need to tell it. This is talking about a personal story and sharing personal stories. But at the same time, this is about considering who your audience is before you tell your story. When you think about who your audience is in for an anti-racist story, you're going to be thinking about where do they come from? What are they ready for? And what are they looking for? Those things may not all be the same. Are they going to honor your story? If it's a story that has pain yours or someone else's, are they going to honor that or will they ignore that? Uh, stories are dynamic. So the audience will always be influenced in the story as you tell it, even if it's by body language or the mood in the room. So it's important to think about your audience as you're choosing your story. The other thing is to think, well, we'll go to the bid list now. The other thing to think about is which story are you choosing to tell? I talked earlier about all the power you have in story choices. So you can ask yourself questions like, is there a dominant narrative that I'm playing into that I want to move away from? Or is the, am I telling my story? Am I going to be telling someone else's story? If you're choosing to tell your story, you might be looking for you know, how personal is this or not? Is it personal but not emotional? That's an important, very fine line to be aware of. And be always aware that storytelling for an audience is a poor substitute for therapy. I say this often because sometimes it feels like if I just bare my soul, I will have told a great story that's meaningful. And that's not the best place for that story all the time. Because then you have to go back to the beginning, which is why are you telling the story? Your story is for you to unburden yourself, bare your soul. If the story is to accomplish something with or for your audience, then maybe it's better to pick a story that you've worked through already and you could discuss at a distance or tell at an emotional distance, even if it's an emotional story. And the last question is who should tell the story? If, you're, if it's your story and you wanna tell it, brilliant. If it's someone else's story and it's a community story like a, a fairy tale or a story that's in the news and you wanna tell it, brilliant. If it's another person's story who maybe you know or can have contact with, or has a different background than yours, a different racial background than yours, a different national cultural background than yours, could they be telling the story? Someone closer to them telling the story? Is there a way to give that story the voice of the person whose story it belongs to? That's an interesting question to think. And now we know that videos work when it comes to telling stories and to sharing information. There's so many things that are opening up in terms of making sure that we're not only getting different stories, but different voices telling those stories. So think about it, who should be telling the story that you want to share? And then I wanna give you some tips on how to tell your story. The first is to use a story structure. I said earlier, the basics, the beginning and the middle and the end. Include details as much as possible. We have a tendency in storytelling to move from action to action because we like action movies. Action feels like it keeps us moving forward. But if you can pause and go through the senses, you know, your, your ears, your eyes, your nose, your, your, your mouth, your, your sense of touch, and add one or two details to your story all along the way, you will make your story real for your audience and draw them in. You want to also avoid rushing to meaning. I think a lot of stories that we tell in which we want to share a culturally or racially difficult moment we're rushing to try to make sure our audience understands the significance of this moment. Do you realize that this hurt? Do you realize that this was wrong? Where if we take time and tell the story and tell with a beginning, here are the people, here's where they come from. This is why they are where they are now. And then a the middle, this is the interaction. This is the fallout. 
this is what came before the interaction, those things. And then the end, this is how she was left. This is how he was left. This is what could have happened later or did happen later. Then we let people feel the meaning in the story or maybe draw conclusions that we didn't know were in the story. So it's avoiding the Aesop's fables. We're not telling stories for a message that's that clear. We have an intention and a purpose, but it's keeping trusting that the meaning of the story is in the story and people will find it if we tell it well. And the next is practice. It, you're better off to have just a few stories that you tell over and over again, or just a couple stories that you tell over and over again, than to have a huge range of stories that you wanna tell. A story changes every time you tell it. I have probably told Little Red Riding Hood in front of a live audience, often of people who never thought they'd have to listen to Little Red Riding Hood live again, because they're older than that now, probably 40, 50, 60 times. And every single time I tell it, it's different. So when we practice our stories, they change. They maybe not get better, but they change and they develop. So keep telling your stories. Now we're gonna leave storytellers behind, keeping you with us, leaving the topic behind. And we're gonna talk about listening. Before I talk about listening at all, I have to thank Callie McLeod because I never ever thought about story listening until I was in Leuven at the CETA EU conference and saw her talk. And I just wanna share the notes. She's mentioned so many things about story is a gift, story is a sacred tool. She has an amazing view of stories and what they can do. And so this whole line of thinking comes from her. And the other person who gave me something to think about story is Ashley Ramden, Ramston, who's a traditional storyteller in the UK, who I've done a couple of workshops with, I've learned from him. And he has this beautiful description of a storyteller, a, a wonderfully skilled traditional storyteller that he worked with, who also taught storytelling. And he showed us how she listened to people who were telling stories in her classes whether they were expert storytellers or beginners. He said they would sit, she would sit and look at them and her mouth would always hang open a little. And when anyone told a story, she was fully there listening to their story like her life depended on it. That kind of story listening is what I hope we can give people when they're telling us their stories because stories are sacred gifts. And when, and now here's the thing, racism. A definition of racism that caught me by the gut a couple of weeks ago. Denise Coates describes racism as the need to ascribe bone deep features to people and then to humiliate, reduce and destroy them. Here's what racism part of it is. It is when we tell the story of other people instead of listening to their stories. It's when we decide what their stories are instead of letting them tell us who they are. And then we let our stories be the dominant stories. Our referring to any group that is not the group talking about themselves. So when we need to learn to listen, we need to, we listen so that we can understand who people really are in groups and individually. So, Yes, we need to learn to listen to stories. We need to learn to listen to stories in order to learn from stories at all. I wanna tell you about the experience of the racialized storyteller. Racialized meaning people, a person who, a person like me, who doesn't feel race themselves necessarily until someone tells them you are. The people who tell me, the, you know, the kids who, gave the Chinese Japanese jokes when I was a kid, the, the other kids who called me, the one who called me a Jap for a year and didn't know, the people who tell me, do you know you look Chinese? Equally, the people who tell me, you know, you don't look very Chinese and on and on and on. These people who give race to a storyteller or a speaker, that's the racialized storyteller. Things that happen when racialized storytellers tell their stories, exoticizing, it's a form of othering that focuses on the difference between the listener and the storyteller and makes that the most interesting aspect of the story. It's stereotype reinforcing and myopic, ignoring the full person and reducing them to often imagined qualities. 
examples like, what's it like to have a Taiwanese mother? What's it like to live in insert country? Minimizing, the opposite of exoticizing. The I understand you, I get you response. It's the refusal to acknowledge the differences in experience. This is a listener who's taking care of their own discomfort at hearing a story that sounds not very nice. So these are questions, these, this questions the relevance of the storyteller's experience, both their physical experience, what happened, and their emotional experience, what the event did to them. Examples like, oh yeah, I know what you mean, or I was the only white person in the room that time when I was on vacation or I studied abroad or I had that one particular job. Those kinds of things, minimizing someone's pain or their experience. The disbelief response. Questioning where the events in the story happened the way the storyteller recounts them. This suggests that the storyteller is an unreliable narrator and not able to understand or describe their own experience. It's calling them incompetent, unable to understand what happened to them even though they were there. This is when we say things like, are we sure, are you sure they said that because of your race? Well, maybe they meant something different by it. Or why do you have to make everything about race? Critique. Suggesting that the storyteller respond to the situation incorrectly, that they took the wrong path, that they made the wrong choice in the story that they are telling you. This suggests that the pain that the story might be about or the experience the story was about was actually the result of the storyteller's mistake. Examples like, you should have just ignored them, or why did you have to say that? Or did you maybe overreact? Listening is hard, but if you do it well, there's so much you can get from listening to other people and their stories. So there's benefits for listening. If you can put all of those things aside, you can learn. Paying attention to alternate interpretations or reactions to a situation can give you so much to learn about what another person's experience is or what you could do differently. It can give you an experience of a new mindset or a setting, literally seeing things through other person's eyes. That's what storytelling is, is seeing an experience through the eyes of the storyteller or the, the, the hero or the narrator in a story. And you can learn about your own worldview because we learn best when that's challenged. When someone presents a reality that is not the same as the one that you're used to, you get to think, see your, your reality, that lens that's in front of you suddenly gets to pop out for you. And there's empathy. Learning about how other people experiencing things. Remember the neuro mirroring where our brains are all creating those same brain waves. You can feel someone else's fear or disorientation, or surprise, or anger. And here's the thing that I've learned about storytelling, people who have told stories, the stories I've listened to about people who encounter, have racist encounters or painful encounters. Most people who go through this, their first response is surprise. It's not anger or fear, it's surprise or shock. I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is happening again. I thought things were different. Though it's not, that's not what I expected, but in learning, listening to lots of stories, it turns out that is what people were sharing. And I have one more quote here about story listening. It's from Michelle Obama, her, her memoir, Becoming. She says, I've learned that it's harder to hate up close. There isn't much more up close than listening to someone's stories and to listening to stories and hearing about what happened. So we can reduce that space for disliking and space for hate. Hate is such a hard word. So let's talk about listening well. There are a few things about listening well that I think are really important. In order to, listening, to listen well, one of the very first things you need to do is embrace your ignorance. Embracing your ignorance is also my starting part, point for all my intercultural work. I start workshops by telling people, I hope they will embrace their ignorance and I'm sure I have nothing to teach them because what we know is what we don't know. When we know what we don't know, and I don't say know what you don't know, but embrace what you don't know, and that means wrap your arms around it and don't let go, then we can learn because we know we can open up to fill up that space, that emptiness we've got our arms wrapped around, we can fill it with other people's stories and experiences and knowledge. So you might have a global idea of what things are like, but stories are personal and they're details. You're going to hear about a specific experience and there's specific lessons in there. Another thing we can do is hold space, stay in the moment, focus on your storyteller, 
Don't think about what you want to say to them or how you want to respond to what they're saying to you. Listen deeply. Try to feel with the storyteller and trust them. Being listening to a story is kind of like being in the backseat of the car. You have to go along for the ride or you'll never get to the destination. Finally, speaking to a lot of people here who are interculturalists, I know that there's, oh, oh, this is the first, my apologies. The other thing I wanna talk about is uh, something I decided to call sonar listening or deep listening. And this comes from a conversation that I had recently with Kondwani Mwasi, who I've had the great privilege of getting to know over the last year or so. His podcast, 54 Lights, this is the plug, Kondwani. Listen to his podcast, it's stories about Africa that are not the stories you're used to hearing. What we talked about was how we hear more stories about other people's pain after having experienced pain ourselves. If you've been through a great loss or experienced personal pain, it, you hear more about other people's loss. My husband had cancer and many years ago, he's healthy now. And when, he, when that happened, it somehow gave me antennas for other people who are dealing with long-term health problems or, or big health scares. And I could hear between the lines of what they were telling me to ask the next question. I think of it as sonar hearing because I was thinking about movies like The Hunt for Red October. They've always got the guy in the subway who's listening to the sonar. He hears the same thing that everyone else hears louder, but he can hear the sound of a boat in there and the direction the boat is traveling in. That's the kind of listening we have to develop when we are listening to people's stories, sonar listening. So even though we're hearing the same noise, we can hear the secret messages and all the secret messages, the hidden, the hard to identify messages or gaps in between and try to ask people to help fill those in for us. And the last thing because of all the interculturals here was the describe, interpret, evaluate exercise a lot of people do where you show an image and you ask people, tell me what you see. This is from the world of visual intelligence in which we think about what, how to not evaluate things at first. So I was thinking, how do we do this if we take this to story listening? If I were doing this as a visual exercise, but not, so if we were doing it as a, as a listening exercise, we would first listen well, right? You wanna get all the details, not just the key events, not just the global, I see five or six women sitting around the flag. You also wanna get into, I see one woman wearing a necklace. I see one woman seems to be doing something to the flag. I see one, two, three, four, maybe five, six stars on the flag. I see the haircuts are mostly either short or updo. So you wanna get into the details, not just the big picture. We want to find out what you don't know, figure out which, why are they working on this? Like, what are they doing to the flag? Is she sewing or is she pointing at something? Why are these women in the room together? What is their relationship to each other? So we wanna ask about the details also for the stories. We wanna to try to imagine what's happening in the bigger picture. What context are these women living in? What time are they living in? How much freedom of movement do they have? Are they seamstresses? Are they wealthy? What's going on there? And after you have all of that and getting the big picture, we can pay attention to how the events impact the people in the story. So why is this an important moment for these women? How does it, how do they feel afterwards? Are they happy or not? It could be the events that have the effect of storyteller if we're talking about listening to someone's personal story. And after we've done all of that work, looked at the details, gotten the bigger picture, thought about context, figured out what we don't know, then we think about ourselves. What are my emotions? What are my thoughts? What are my responses to this? If we could apply that to listening to people, if we could apply that to listening to stories, we would get so much more out of every story we listen to and so much more connection with the storyteller as well. So if you want to listen well, embrace your ignorance, hold it tight, hold space for your storyteller, practice sonar listening, listen to, to the direction, not just the big sounds, and use your visual intelligence skills that you've been working on in order to also develop listening intelligence skills. That could be a new thing. So stories and anti-racism, anti-racism. Remember, anti-racism anti is all about action. It's what you do that matters. So what you can do is seek new stories. You can read memoirs or biographies about people who 
are different than you. You can watch films or biopics. You can think about where you're getting your stories from. If you're getting lots of stories from one place, a newspaper or a magazine, an Instagram feed, and consider trying a different source or adding sources so you can get more stories. You can go for reading lists, ask on social media, if there's a topic you're interested in. Believe me, there's a list on the internet that will get you started. You can also share new stories, tell new stories when you have the opportunity. This is me and adding, choosing to use more women and people, people of color stories when I realized I was telling, talking about Steve Jobs way too much. You can also use your platform in order to let other people tell their stories and bring new stories into your environment and pay attention to the voices that are telling those stories. Give people an opportunity to tell their own stories if you can, because their particular perspectives and voices are so important to share. You can work on your story. Now, I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but I think it is a really key part to anti-racism work and storytelling, which is figuring out your own story, your background story, where are you coming from? how to share your insights into situations and your life experiences. Your own story work is crafting, telling, taking in the responses to your story and to do your own anti-racism work. If you're white, you might wanna write the story or tell the story of your white privilege to explore what that is and what it has been. Every story has a beginning and a middle and end. Maybe it started somewhere and you want it to end somewhere else. You can tell that story or start thinking about where you want it to go. If you are in the global majority, you might want to write your experience or an activism story. Again, thinking about where you came from, what you've been through, and where do you want to go. Those That work can be a really wonderful way of using story to do anti-racism work. In both cases, remember that the listening and the storytelling are both vitally important. So you can work on your story, but tell it as well. That's the building relationships. Tell it to a friend. Maybe you're sharing someone else's pain. Maybe you can share some, with somebody what your pain is like or your curiosity or your gaps. This is, the, this is the ignorance that I found and I'm embracing it and I wanna figure out how to fill it. And finally, listen. Listen with all you've got to other people's stories. Mouths agape and with all the attention you can muster. Thank you so much for listening to me. I have just really been thrilled with the opportunity to share this with so many people. Um, I would love to answer questions. I wish we could make a big old story circle and hear lots of different people's stories, but I don't think that the medium is gonna work this time. Um, so please put your stories in the Q&A and we'll get around to those. I have one more slide here, which is about that. <laughs> this, is, this is where my beautiful slideshow comes from. They said to do the credits, this is where it comes from. And finally, I would love to continue this conversation. It's a very new one for me. And I have found that it was really exciting and interesting to start thinking about these things. Um, you can find me at my website, www.storycraft.nl. Feel free to email me, Christina at storycraft.nl. I'm on Instagram and Twitter. And I will take everything that we that came up today and anything that we come up in a Q&A that I, I want to add and put it into a summary download, hopefully be a little bit pretty, that you can get on my website next week. And I'll also create a bibliography in case you're looking for some resources. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I hope we can do some Q&A, B. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Christine. I mean, I really resonated with uh, which story do you choose to tell? In the Q&A, we have from Elizabeth. She said, it's not really a question, but I just wanted to say that sometimes the story is about my reaction to someone else's story, what that story meant to me, what insights it gave me, how it became a turning point in my life. Mm, I think that's so important though, because th this is, right, this is the result of deep listening. If you're really listening to someone else's story, it can touch you in a way that changes the direction you take afterwards. So telling a story about listening to a story sounds like the ultimate like meta and beautiful experience in order to tell other people how we can be better listeners. I would, so the really the question I wanted like, Elizabeth, if we ever get to sit down, I wanna know about which story changed your life. That's great, that's a great touch point. Anonymous asks, 
how do you ask after someone's experience, someone else's experience, um, when it is exotic to you um, without exoticizing it? From your examples, it seems as if there is a fine line. Could you expand on this? Yeah. Thank you so much for that question. I think it's really hard because it's it feels also impossible to answer. Um, what I face in, in is a lot of people who look at my face and try to figure out what's going on. Um, and it can be a terrible experience. It can be someone uh, in a position of power looking at me and saying, what are you who I don't feel like I can say no to and that, le that just leaves a horrible, a horrible aftertaste. Generally, what I tell people is that I never ask people I would never ask people a question about their face appearance, that kind of difference that I can see the first time I meet them. I mean, I may be the, not even maybe the second or third time I meet them because that's not who they are. It's an aspect of the, the body they move through life with. And we have to separate those things. There's who you are and there's the body you move through life in. And if we make people just their bodies, and that's what racism is, right? It's making someone their skin color, or it's making someone the shape of their eyes, or it's making someone their hair. There are people, we're all more than that. And if you reduce someone to that, that's exoticizing them. If, you know, I have been in a conversation with someone for a while, we're getting to know each other. I want to know more about you and your whole person. Then if I ask, can you tell me your background? I'm really curious, where are you from? that will be a natural part of a conversation. So I think it has to do with making sure that your intention is clear to you and the person you talk to and that your intention is to get to know the person and not just what's going on with the body they move through life with. I always think, you know, the chances that I would meet someone who was in a wheelchair and ask them, hey, what's your name? How you doing? Why are you in a wheelchair? Are very slim. And I think that's a thing that we can identify with easier than saying, hey, what you doing? How are you? Where are you from? You, you talk different. So that's the context that I try to think about it. And if the intention is to get to know the person, it will flow easier. Okay, intention. Tatiana has, uh, says, thank you, Christine. My question is the following. What is the line between giving space to the storyteller and showing empathy by showing understanding? You said that saying, I understand what you went through is a minimizing strategy, mm -hmm. but it can also um, be interest. Let's see, I can see it can, it can also become a paralyzing fear to do it wrong. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if you ever watch people who are in deep conversation with each other, you will see lots of nonverbal cues that we give to each other um, in terms of giving space and showing interest. The nodding, the sounds, mm -hmm, uh -huh, mm -hmm. that's a way. When you say, I understand what you went through, my feeling is always, if you haven't been through the same experience, then you don't understand. If you've been through the same experience, then that makes sense to say. I think it's the same thing um, to make it a very, very much a woman's perspective as a man looking at a woman and saying, birth, giving birth to a child, I understand what you went through. Most all women on the planet who have given birth to a child will look at the man and say, no, you don't. You think you do, maybe you witnessed it, maybe you were there, but you don't know what I went through. And in that way, saying someone, I understand what you went through can be really, really minimizing because you're not acknowledging that they maybe went through something that's difficult to understand, or maybe they even have difficulty articulating it for you to understand. So I'm always very cautious with the, I understand what you went through as a response. To show empathy is also to say, oh, that sounds terrible, or oh, I, I, I could never, I couldn't imagine that. Um, Empathy is feeling for the person. It's not saying that you, it doesn't necessarily come with understanding. It comes with an emotional connection to the person and having a desire to be there for them, to support them. 
And it doesn't come necessarily through telling them what their experience is or telling them that you know what their experience is. It's really about letting people know you're there. Sometimes just sitting with a person can be enough. I hope that helps. I think this, these are all incredibly good questions. Um, and I don't think there are pat answers. I think these are things that we, we practice and we try. And if you're very lucky, Tatiana, then there's someone in your life or in your circle who you can speak to and say, you know, I know we've had these hard conversations and this is what I said. Did that feel to you supportive or did that not feel so good? And maybe there's someone that can give you some direct feedback. And there's also a lot of resources online that you can go and how can I be an empathetic listener and find really key resources if you're looking for phrases. I'm always very careful about giving people a phrase to say because things like empathy and good listening, there aren't recipes for it. It's something you have to feel out and make mistakes, but we have to make mistakes in order to get to doing it right. This is what we're constantly telling our children. We're constantly telling each other, don't try to be a perfectionist so that you can get things done. And if we're trying to be perfect in the way we interact with people, we won't get the work done of connecting with people and being emotionally attacked, connected with people. And that's what we really need to try to accomplish. I think we're... <laughs> so are you ready for the next? Yeah, I'm gonna take okay. a sip of water. Okay. So Vincent says, starts, in French, historia means both history and story. Would you conclude that history is a series of stories we write or tell each other and also interpret differently? Hence, many variations and in interpretations, inclusion versus exclusion, racism, ethnocentrism, colonialism, et cetera. Um, short answer, yes. History is a series of, I mean, the, the, the saying goes that the victor writes the history, right? That we can, the person who wins the war decides who was the good guy in the war and the versions that come later. Um, so concluding that history is a series of stories that we write or tell, yes. And interpret differently, yes. And there are also lots of dominant interpretations of history and those stories out there that are often getting in the way or preventing us from seeing other perspectives. Uh, David van Rijbroek is a, a Belgian author who's been writing some books over the last 10 years or so. And he's definitely not the only one. He's the ones that popped into my head. He's written a book about the Congo, the history of the Belgians in the Belgian Congo from the perspective, not of the colonizer, but of those who were colonized. Yeah, he's written now just recently about Indonesia um, and the, the Dutch role there. Those are also stories. And I think what happens with history, when we think of history as something studied in schools, is that there's a selection made in those stories that we tell. And the selection is what determines what our idea of history is. And so our job is to listen to and find more of those stories to tell each other so that the history that we are building for ourselves and our children and that we are sharing as a community or a nation is representing the voices of all the people who participated in those moments and not just the people who were the victors. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sedja, mm -hmm. I'm gonna need a little help with this. Sedja said, I would be interested in Christine's idea about taking advantage of stories of others. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you know that BIPOCs or BIPOCs? Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned it and I would be interested in more. You, so this is, um, thank you Shada for, for the question. Um, BIPOC is black indigenous people and people of color. So it's kind of a, a, a broad category term. Um, I think this comes from, the whole idea of this came to me from a discussion about telling stories in cultural contexts and which stories, oh, the fact that people are often looking to uh, white experts on other cultures in order to talk about those cultures. So when we get books that are about lots of different cultures that we end up um, hearing the, the white author's version of what all those cultures are like, as opposed to, for example, the, you know, the Kenyan expert telling us about Kenya, the book that would be uh, uh, all of those voices together. I, I don't know about it yet. And what I'm interested in and what I think would be really great is if you want to do an anti-racism program 
or you're going to run a workshop and you want to tell a story and you are who you are because you can't be anyone else. I am and will always be a Taiwanese American person. If I want to tell a story or I want my audience to hear a story of a black experience or uh, in, 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 in even a, a white experience or a Hispanic or Latinx experience, um, to get those people to tell their stories somehow. That could be a guest speaker. It could be using a video that you uh, from YouTube. It could be recording someone telling a story and showing that story. It could be that person video conferencing into your presentation. I think that what I'm interested in is making is that we think about not only the content of the story, the words and the things that happen in the story, but like literally the face and the voice that's telling that story gives texture to the story. And if we start to highlight those faces and voices more, then we can normalize having a diversity of faces telling a diversity of stories, as opposed to that being anything special. It seems like it should be normal to me that if we're gonna talk about, you know, black experience that it's a black person telling me about it, for example. So those are my thoughts. So this is all, these are, you know, the, 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 the hedging is that these are new thoughts. I'm not sure how this would work. I'd love to hear, I'd like to try it and see how it goes. I think it would be really neat. So thank you, Shada, for the question. Okay, then the next one I'll take is Susan, who says, would love some tips, ideas for approaching or responding to the racialized storyteller. Okay, I brought it up. Tips, I think really what I talked about in terms of how you can listen well, embracing your ignorance, acknowledging what you don't know about their experience, what you don't know about the situation, what you don't know about what has gone before in their lives. I think those things are really very, very important. Um, and listening from your heart and not from your brain, which means listening to a person who's telling you a story of a thing that happened to them. And this is not the same as ignoring color or ignoring racial difference, but searching to make sure you're listening to that person and catching yourself if you fall into being defensive or um, if you catch yourself into trying to rationalize things or trying to explain things. If a person has had an experience and they have a way of understanding that, the very least we can do to respect them as storytellers is to hear them out and try to understand where they're coming from. All the rest can come later. So I, I hope that helps Susan. It's a tough thing to do. Okay, anonymous. His question or her question is, how can we use storytelling to foster intercultural dialogue in a way that is dynamic and not just one-sided? Oh, I love this question because we think of storytelling as delivering, right? Um, I think that uh, my ideal situation would be some kind of story circle where we can all tell stories and listen. The things we have to be careful for is making sure that everyone really gets to tell their stories and gets listened to. I think that intercultural dialogue, dynamic. Dynamic means you're listening and telling your story. It means you're listening and asking questions. I think you know, I'd like to see the situation where you're only allowed to, you, you know, you, where we have a series of questions of stories that different people tell us different stories about different experiences. And the only way you're allowed to respond is with genuine questions about their experience in, in terms of what happened, how did you feel, what did you do next? And you're not allowed to give your opinion and say, well, this is what I think. I think that's um, working on that towards that kind of understanding or we're cutting time and saying we can ask questions for 15 minutes and then respond with what we think about it for five minutes. So those things are limited. Those are, are things that come to mind when I think about how can we foster intercultural dialogue. There are definitely people out there who are experts on this subject and it's not me. I would love to find them and refer you to them. Um, but I think these are, these are great starting points. Thank you so much, uh, lovely anonymous attendee for that mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the next would be from Rosemary who says, I am interested to understand when and how you yeah. use the Little Red Riding Hood story. 
So I love the Little Red Riding Hood story. I give storytelling workshops that are about how to do story structure. So how do you build a story using story structure? I give them to people who do all from bachelor's students to professionals, from people in academics to entrepreneurs. And I always talk about the stories, the Little Red Riding Hood as a way to understand story structure because it takes them out of anything they're familiar with or that they think they're familiar with. And so we can actually just talk about story structure. So what happens is I will introduce to them a story structure and then I will use Little Red Riding Hood as an example. Therefore, the result is I have told that story live and with great um, animation many more times than most people my age have in the last three years. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Okay, then Viral. What is the impact of nationalism on racism and how can we tell a story? Oh, girl, I'm just gonna have to think about this. This is like a, this feels like a PhD <laughs> answer. The impact of nationalism on racism. I think you're asking me here, how does where we're from or our feeling for our nation impact racism? I don't have a pat, I don't have an answer for that. I think, we would like to believe, or maybe we think that there are different ideas of racism in different places, that there are different kinds of racism in different places, different expressions of racism in different places. But I can't, I don't know that I can really come to a good answer. This is me embracing my ignorance with like big wide arms. Um, and I think if you're asking about how to tell a story within nationalism, I think I don't understand the question well enough to say anything really, really useful here. Can I take a pass card? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> thank you for your honesty. Um, Kimberly says, thank you. Any tips for navigating the fine line between cultural celebration mm -hmm. of someone else's story culture and cultural mm -hmm. appropriation when retelling, showing to encourage others to discover for themselves directly? Okay, wow, Kimberly, great question. Um, first of all, I think cultural appropriation is not necessarily all retelling or showing to encourage other people to discover things. I think cultural appropriation is taking something for your own without acknowledging where it comes from or that it has um, an origin that maybe you don't fully understand. I think about things like Indian headdress or Indian Native American original people, all of the language for that, um, or coming back from vacation wearing clothes of the place you're from or displaying objects that may have religious or spiritual significance, that kind of thing. Um, I think the line be celebrating someone else's culture, I think the line is one that we cross into like from appropriate to inappropriate when we a learn a lot about it, deeply learn things about it, not just at the surface. Um, and also again, try to get those voices into helping you plan your celebration or helping you have your celebration. Um, that seems to me to be the best way to do it so you can get an understanding of, of what it is. Um, and if you're celebrating something and there aren't any people who represent that community in your community, then my question is, why are you celebrating it? Um, that might be where for me it goes into some cultural appropriation. Um, and there's a difference between cultural appropriation and making it our own. I know there are, you know, I live in the Netherlands, there are people who like to celebrate Halloween. Um, the Halloween that people celebrate here is not the Halloween that I grew up with and I don't have a need to participate in it. And I really feel like they're doing their own thing with Halloween that has nothing to do with my idea of Halloween. Of course, there's you know very little heavy cultural significance in Halloween, but that kind of you know it that kind of thing I think has to do with being in dialogue with people who represent the cultures that you want to celebrate. And if you can, you know, reach out to them and find out how to how to do it well. I think that would probably be your best bet. Thank you so much, Kimberly. I love that you're celebrating all kinds of things, by the way. I like celebrations are always so good. Yes, um, amazing questions. Great. Inga, uh, do you have any other tips for how white writers can include a diverse cast of characters 
and proactively ensure representation on their pages without culturally appropriating the stories that aren't theirs? Oh, Inga, this is an awesome question. It feels a little bit like a um, oh, trick question. I love it. Um, how white writers can include a diverse cast of characters and proactively ensure representation on their pages. I think that there are two things and I may step wrong when I say this. I think there is a difference between representing a world that you are familiar with or know or want to represent and, and whitewashing a world. In other words, not representing things that could be there. If I were to write a story that was about me, you know, growing up in South Dakota in the 1980s, or a character growing up in the 1980s, the fact of the matter is there would be very, very few people there who were not white. Um, there would maybe be a couple of characters who were Native American, probably Lakota Sioux, and there might be a couple of people of color um, in a whole cast of hundreds of characters. So I think it comes down to, in terms of deciding whether you're going to have characters of, of color or diverse characters, it comes to thinking about what you're trying to accomplish in your story and the setting of your story. And if that's something that is a goal for you in your storytelling, which I think is wonderful, then the key is to get to know some real people, I think, or read a whole lot about those people, not in the forms of fiction, but in the forms of memoirs and biographies to understand what people really experience. Um, I think that it also means taking people out of typecasting. I recently read the book, um, Chinatown Interior by Charles Yu. He was Taiwanese American and won the National Book Prize. And it is about exactly this, this idea of, of, of uh, appropriating stories gone gone completely off the rails as far as you can possibly take it so that the characters don't even get names anymore. They just get typecast labels. Um, and I think that if, if, if this is the question you're asking, how to ensure that we're not culturally appropriating, that that book in its way tells you how it looks when it's gone wrong. And of course he gets away with it. It, it, it works beautifully because he is Taiwanese American and he's, he's, he's falls victim to this kind of typecasting in life. Um, but I think that is a way into thinking about this. I think this is hard, but I think it's work that we have to keep working on it. So thank you, Inga, for the question. That's a great answer. We have to keep working on it. Viral uh, asks, can we say that we are narrating the subjects that we cannot express clearly? Mm, yeah, narrating the subjects that we cannot express. Yeah, I think we can talk about things. I think it's also okay. Um, I'm maybe it's just me. I'm very, very comfortable with saying I don't know about things. And I think that when we can't, if we don't can't express it clearly, it's also okay to say, I'm gonna try this out on you. I'm gonna try to get this. Can you come back to me and tell me what you're hearing so I can figure out what I'm communicating and we can try to close that gap between what I'm trying to say and what you're communicating to me. And I think that when we engage our listeners like that and ask them to help us storytell, that we can close those gaps. When I teach storytelling, I always tell people that you can get feedback from anybody. You just need to ask them two questions. One is, how, does, how do you feel at the end of my story? And two is, what are the questions you have? The how do you feel is trying to work towards what is your story accomplishing? What is it doing to them? To see, you know, if I want you to feel inspired at the end of this, did I get there? The what questions do you have? That's the gaps question. So you're talking about narrating subjects that you can't express clearly. Where your expression gets fuzzy, that comes in when people are going to say, you know, I this is I don't understand what's going on here. This part I don't really know what that means. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, one of the things I, I I really wanted to include in this, and I now realize I forgot, is that one of the ways you can respond to these racialized storytellers or when you're having problems with expressing or understanding what people are trying to express is the way that I learned in my um, creative writing critiques, which is to respond in terms of what you understand and don't understand. So if a racialized storyteller is telling you a story or if someone is telling a story that they can't express clearly, instead of saying, you're being unclear, this doesn't make any sense, you did the wrong thing, you could ask questions, you can say things or make statements like, I don't understand 
why this happened and then that happened. I don't understand why you made that choice. I need to think about um, what, or I don't understand what's behind these things. By by coming at it from a term, from from a perspective trying to understand as opposed to trying to interpret, um, you can open up space so that we can find ways to talk about things and make space for our storytellers so they can feel safe with not having gotten it perfect for you because every audience is different. So I hope that helps Pharrell. This is a really amazing question. Um, these are all really challenging questions. I like this a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it really is um, enlightening. <laughs> Jennifer asks, sometimes it feels that there is a pressure on the verbal storyteller to entertain and to feed short attention spans. Mm -hmm. This sometimes has the result of minimizing or missing the purpose of the story because the intention is to entertain. Any tips? Yes, so much. This, <laughs> when I started telling stories, like actively standing in front of a group of people and telling a story about me, um, it was terrifying. And I noticed that everyone got that glossed over look on their faces. And it took me a while to realize that that is me not, that is not me losing my audience. When people are, when you lose your audience, they move, they don't sit still. When people have that like glassed over look and you think you're losing them, they are deep in your story. They are with you. So actually storytellers don't have to entertain. They have to tell their stories and the stories entertain. It's not your job. The story's job is to entertain or maybe not because not all stories are supposed to be entertaining. Stories give us information, they tell us what happens, they give us a way of seeing the world. So my suggestion is the next time you tell a story, take a step back, take a deep breath, slow down. I know it's hard. I am terrible at most of those things. And when you go into your story, focus on adding the sensory details, not the, oh, I know so-and-so because we met there and we did that. that those, those are not the details that people always need. Those are the details we have to be careful about. The sensory details. I went and I was sitting on my chair and it was a little rough. In fact, I think there's a thin part in the cushion underneath my left leg and I had felt like I was gonna get a bruise. That kind of detail will bring people into your story and you don't entertain, you give them an experience to live. And that is what it is. I think, yeah, entertainment is for movies and TV and, and yeah, I'm never gonna, I, I don't think that's a thing for storytellers to aim for. I think storytellers have to tell their stories um, and then let the story do the work. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, mm -hmm. for that question. Oh, okay, great. The next um, question comes from Anonymous. It says, I often find it difficult to describe someone's features without sounding racist. For instance, it almost feels judgmental to describe features like skin color, even if this is not the case at all. What is an appropriate way to deal with this? Great question. That is an awesome. Okay, I don't have the final answer on this. I can give you my take on it. And I can tell you this kind of in the form of a story, which is that I am the mother of two children, now nine and 12 years old. And I can tell you for certain that the first time that my child said, look at that dark person or brown person, I was mortified because I had this idea that I was supposed to teach my child to be appropriate and we don't call people brown or dark. Except the thing is, my child was telling me what they said, saw. They were literally describing what they saw to me and I was putting the meaning in it. That's racializing. And so if we want to describe people and you start saying, I'll be standing, you know, if it's a blind date and you're saying, I'll be in the back of the room, I've got blonde hair, blue eyes and light skin, that's gonna be helpful information. I think the question is, what is the information for? Um, and also like to avoid saying that someone is black or Asian and they are, produces the most insanely awkward situations. Um, so I don't know, an appropriate way to deal with this, I think is to just to be respectful and not make it the only thing you say about a person. Um, you know, I am like average height, kind of Asian looking, long hair, smiles sometimes. 
if, if you know, if that's how someone were to describe me, I wouldn't be offended. Um, and I, I don't know, I think that we can turn some of these things into problems when they're not and focus on them. I don't know, I feel like I would like to ask someone else to help me answer this one. But um, I don't think there's a pat answer. I think it has to do with intention and that we have to think carefully about what we need people to know. Um, yeah, B, I'm just like gonna float a little on this one. <laughs> well, it's hard like, though, right? That's it, it's the work, it's the work. It's hard, I need to read, I'm gonna educate myself and come back to this question. <laughs> That's what I feel like is the right answer. Great, great, great to say. <laughs> great honesty. Elizabeth um, wants to know, she said you mentioned Kelly McLeod. Uh, what was the other name, please, you mentioned as a good resource on listening well? It was Ashley Ramston. Um, Ashley doesn't actually talk about listening or write about listening anywhere that I know of. I got that from him in a workshop that I attended um, in the UK. Um, but I will be creating the, the download. I will put all the resources that I used in this webinar uh, in the slides will go into a download that you can get on my website next week. Um, we'll get it already so that y'all can have a huge list of books and things to look at. Thank you. Okay, and the last I is from Anonymous and I'm not sure she says, or he says, uh, you need a, UNIDO had developed a technique called story circles uh, to foster intercultural dialogue. Do you know it? No, I need to look into this. Another resource. Let's check wow. it out. Wow, that was amazing, Christine. <laughs> wow, um, thanks everyone for being so present and um, bringing Absolutely. yourself fully to the conversation. Yes, and uh, the, the the chat, the Q and A was really, um, really people were really uh, deep into the subject, and and I'm glad to say thank you for being a part of this conversation. So we are getting towards near the end of of the talk, and I uh, just want to remind you that uh, the. The next in the anti-racism series will be March 3rd, 6 p.m. It's called Understanding the Influence of Power Relations and the Dialogue on Racism. And that's Sedja Berman Kutsal. Shada is her name, Shada Berman. Shada, you know her. I do, she's lovely. Go, it'll be the best. Great. Yes, I wanted to say also, um, you can find this and register at CETAREU.org. Um, and while you're there, look up your national CETAR if you're not already a member and join us. I think you see we're, we're a great bunch. <laughs> uh, so again, thank you. A lot of people now are also saying thank you as we come to the close of, of the evening. And this talk will be available in possibly the next 24 hours, within 24 hours on our YouTube channel. So please uh, go there for the talk. And if you've enjoyed this talk, uh, please come to the next one. This, as I said, was the eighth in the series. Christine, is there anything you want to say before we close off? I want to thank BU so much for um, guiding me through this and other people behind the scenes. Um, I have had a wonderful time. And thank you all so much for listening and your questions. This has been brilliant. I've had a great time. Thank you. So much, so much love in the chat. This is Thank crazy. You mm -hmm. It's been a great night. People from all over the world wow. have, have shown their 
infinity for this topic and storytelling. I should say how it resonated with me. Um, <laughs> storytelling as part, part of anti-racism work. I think that was a great, a great thing. And then you told a great quote. It was really, um, whoever makes up the story makes up the world. Mm. It's so true though. Yes, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Wow. Have enjoy your your time zone wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Have a nice a nice day. Goodbye.